Oh, amen. What a good start. Thank you, band. Thank you for leading us into worship and putting us in the posture of receiving God's spirit. We come here to connect with each other, but to mostly connect with God, knowing that he is here to meet us. And when we show up, we know that he's here ready to go. I look forward to what he's going to reveal to us today, this morning. We're in the book of Luke. And uh, as I mentioned last, or at the introduction two weeks ago, um, we're looking primarily at Jesus' life, specifically what he has said, how he acted. Uh, His actions uh, is the main focus, his words and actions. Um, But we did a little derivation. We'll take some some detours every once in a while into some other uh, people, other characters, like we did last week with John the Baptist. But we are going to skip back. John the Baptist was in chapter 3. We're going to take a, a skip back to chapter 2 because there's a section in there that just brought a lot of questions. And it was Jesus' first time speaking, and so we can't miss that. That's uh, Luke 2, 41 through, 41 through 52. Um, but as I'm reading, as I'm studying this last this part where Jesus is 12 years old and this whole incident that happens, a bunch of questions just came. And what I realize is, again, which we've all realized from time to time, is there is nothing about Jesus's growing up years. Nothing except this one little spot when he's 12 years old, and then we jump to when he's 30. And so I've titled the sermon, Jesus Goes AWOL. So... <laughs> I'm um, not sure that's exactly it, but he does indeed from the scriptures, from what we have in the gospel, there is no documentation, no details about the accounts of his life on earth until age 30. So, you know, in the past, as I, as I wrote in the, in the summary, in the past, I've been saddened by that, you know, but moved on. Okay, oh well. But this week particularly, it hit me. I'm like, you know, God, we are trying to get to know you. We want to be closer to you. We want to go deeper with you. Why on earth did you not inspire somebody to record Jesus' early life? I mean, how many times do we enjoy going through photo albums or, or scrapbooks of, of earlier life, of ours, of people that are close and dear to us? We want to know them as they were as a child, as teen years, their post-teen years, their 20s. We want to know because that helps us to get to know the heart and the soul and the spirit of someone. Why, do, why God didn't do that, I don't know. But the upside of, of frustration is that it can compel you to try to dig and try to figure some things out. And so as I went into some online sources, there's this great source, by the way, it's an online Bible college that gives you like coursework, courses on, on different historical uh, things through Uh, looking at the Mishnah, through looking at historical writings of the Jewish culture, through all of that. And there was so much information from rabbinical interpretations of Scripture and their literature that has stuff from the 70 to 200 A.D. But actually, when you look at the oral traditions and what they record about the, the ethical, the social, the legal considerations, all of that goes from the first century B.C. through the first century A.D. That's what you find in the Mishnah. And so when you start to look into those things, you see a picture of the life that every solid Jewish family, Jewish boy would grow up in. And so from that, we can extrapolate and know, saying, okay, Jesus grew up in a solid Jewish home. How would it have been likely? What would he likely have been doing during his years that are not recorded? So we're going to definitely dive into Luke 2, but this week I want to look at a little bit of that history, and I want to share what I discovered with you, what I've never took time to explore before. But I want to share it, even though it's a little more history than what we usually have. I want to share because when I walked away, I felt a little closer to Jesus. I felt like I had gotten some snapshots, had a picture, had that scrapbook come off the shelf and taken a little bit more of a look at his life. And I hope that as we look at that, those missing years of of his life, that you too will feel a little closer, like you get to know this Jesus, our Jesus, a little bit more. So Jesus as a Jew. Well, I think, first of all, we touched on this briefly in our study um, in our study this morning, is our faith as Christians is largely related and connected to Judaism. 
because Jesus came into the world, Jesus Christ, we follow his life, he came into the world as a Jew. He was reared by his earthly parents who were Jewish. He thought like a Jew. He trained under the Jewish tradition. He worshipped his heavenly father as a Jewish person would worship. Very simply, he was a Jew in all respects. And when he went into ministry, we're going to find out his teaching methods were very much that of a Jewish rabbi, very much like a Jewish teacher. So to know Jesus better, to understand the words that he spoke, his teachings more clearly, we have to have more of an understanding of his Jewish roots from that first century AD that, were, that will help us appreciate more of his Eastern ways. And of course, we're just going to scratch the surface. There's so much here, but it's a beginning. And hopefully as we go through the book of Luke, um, I will be able to make those tie-ins for you to, so you see that connection. So after, we're not going to go over the birth of Jesus because we did that at Christmas. After he was born in Bethlehem, instead of returning immediately to their village of Nazareth, they went to Egypt because they feared Herod would kill their, their newborn son. And so after Herod died, he and his family returned back to Nazareth. And Nazareth was in the region of Galilee. So what do we know about Nazareth? We heard that one phrase, someone said, a little good can come out of Nazareth. Well, first century AD, the region of Galilee, that whole region had this reputation, this reputation of being a bit backwards. It was hill country, and the people were hill people. But what was not commonly known is that it was also an area of Palestine that had a reputation for its strong Hebrew religious education in Judaism. They were simple people, but they had a reverence for the scriptures and a desire to know God and to be connected to him and to soak themselves in the scriptures. So they had this, which translated to a very vibrant religious communities of people, of Jewish people around, devoted to family life, to the synagogue, to the keeping of the Torah, to studying it and knowing it. Well, the village of Nazareth was one of those communities, one of those vibrant communities. It was an agricultural community. So Jesus grew up in a, in a small, simple uh, village that grew grapes, olives, wheats, and other grains. As the residents... They lived very simply, but their homes, they valued their homes being really well built. They were, when they uncovered archaeologically, they found that this simple village that didn't even have paved streets, uh, they didn't have bathhouses at all, but they made sure that their, that their floors of their little houses were cobblestone. That stood out in Nazareth. They had cobblestone. So they must have had like a cobblestone guy you know, local stores saying, hey, get your cobblestones here. So there was no, so simple village, cobblestone floored houses. They did not have any fortification around the village, and they had just one well for their water supply. It was at the end of the village. So Jesus, to go get water to help his mom out, Mary, it's actually now referred to as Mary's well. It's at the end of the village because that would have been the well she would have visited frequently, the only one. To supplement their water, they would catch rainwater off their roofs, and that's how they would supplement because they only had one, one source. They had one public building in, in the village of Nazareth. It was a synagogue, and in the synagogue, that's where they would meet for worship, obviously. That would meet for their community center. Any community events they would have, like Inspire, they would have community events here. They would have their education. Their schools would take place in the synagogue. So this little village, grapes, olives, grains, or that's what they'd grow, cobblestone floors. This is where Jesus grew up, one well, one building that they'd all congregate. Now, we know that Joseph was a carpenter, right? So as is the tradition, um, uh, Jesus' father, since he was a carpenter by trade, then Jesus would have learned the art of carpentry. The village of Nazareth, however, was so small that it was very unlikely that Joseph could have made a profitable living by focusing his carpentry trade in just that village alone. So when you look at biblical scholars, they look and they find that there's a Gentile city that's not talked about in the scriptures, but it's a, within four miles of Nazareth called Zephorus or Zephyrus. 
that population was 12,000 people. And so these inhabitants within four miles of Nazareth, they would have needed carpenters. And so if you had a good carpenter trade, it would have been likely that they would have gone to Zephyrus and had many of their residents be their clients. Zephyrus was the capital of Galilee, and it was called the Gem of Galilee by Josephus. It was this beautiful city. And uh, so it was very possible. When I was thinking about that, here Jesus is learning carpentry. He's learning it from his father. He's with his father and his brothers. They're traveling to this Gentile city to serve the clients there. What better foundations are being laid for Jesus to start to mix and serve with another culture, with those of different religions, that his father would not likely have been closed to that, to that kind of interaction, whether they had faith or no faith. The training of a Hebrew child, the education, Education in Judaism was an extremely important element, especially for those who were practicing Jews. And the goal was, of course, to transmit knowledge and skills generation to generation. Well, as mentioned, Je Galilee was one of the strongest, had one of the strongest educational systems in Judaism, surpassing all of Judea, even including Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was the head where the priests were, the Levites, the, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, all of that resided in Jerusalem. And yet Galilee, the region of Galilee, about 63 miles from there, is the one that was known, was reputed for their educational system. The, they have certain top religious conservatives of the, of the first century, rabbis, teachers, um, theologians that came from there. Uh, were known to come from the Galilee region. And this is where Jesus was raised. Isn't that neat how God makes things happen along the way? From birth until five years of age, religious training would begin at the home. They wouldn't take them. We went, no preschool. They wouldn't send them out. Described in Deuteronomy chapters 5 through 7, the children would begin with the faith of the parents. It was spoken of on a regular basis, connecting with everything they did. In the Torah, the teachings in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 says, impress them on your children. Whatever you know of God, the teachings, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down and when you get up, when you walk and when you lie down, when you all, at every juncture, talk about your faith, talk about God, share and pass on your faith. Well, we know that Joseph and Mary were devout Jews. They would have trained Jesus in the manner accustomed with any observant Jew in the area of Galilee. Luke 2, 39 tells us that Mary and Joseph did everything according to the law of Moses. And so they would have trained Jesus in that same manner. And Jesus himself affirms that he had kept all of his father's commandments. In John, he says that. In Matthew, he says he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So there's this, this picture that the, the traditions, the laws, the, the customs, the teachings that were important to Joseph and Mary were indeed transmuted and, and passed on to Jesus, passed on in the way that, that the typical Jewish family would do that. However, from age 5 to 10, this is where the educational system shifts. Now, girls continue to stay at home and learn, from, learn the trade of the home from their mom. But every Jewish boy would be sent then to the synagogue to be educated. So Jesus would have attended the local synagogue to begin formal education in Judaism. And the first step, ages 5 through 10, was called the Bet Safar. The Bet, Bet, Bet Safar. It's the house of the book. And in this time period of five years from age five to ten is when they would have been taught by a scribe or a rabbi, and their main focus, focus was to memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So when you're five years old to ten years old, your whole focus is memorizing the Torah. This is how Jesus would have spent his years. Now, what's kind of cool is the first day when they arrive at the synagogue, the rabbi, they had little slates kind of things that they would scribble on. They would have, they would go around to each, each boy and they would pour honey on each slate. And then they would have the boys, as, they, as they're reading the scripture from Ezekiel or from Psalms, they would have instruct the boys to lick the honey up. And they would repeat, may you never forget that the word of God is like honey. 
taste and see that the word of God is good. Isn't that a great way to start the scriptures, right? And imagine boys age five to now 10, maybe they were strict rabbis, maybe they weren't, but can you imagine the sticky mess of honey and the fun that they could have with that? I imagine Jesus wasn't um, immune to all that. They studied seven days a week. Seven days a week, they would go to the synagogue to learn. I say, what about the Sabbath? Surely they would take a break on the Sabbath. Well, they would. They would not learn any new material on the Sabbath. They would just be repeating what was already learned, the scriptures that they'd already learned. So little by little, over five years, these boys would learn the Torah by rote memory. The rabbi and the scribe, what they'd do is they'd read the Torah out loud in Hebrew, and then they'd have an interpreter that would stand there. So this is how Jesus would have learned. So the interpreter would stand there. He was skilled in languages, and he would shout out the scripture back to the students in Aramaic because that was the mother tongue. That was the language that Jesus would have been speaking in. And so it was read in Hebrew. It was shouted back to them in Aramaic so they could put into memory in their own, in their own language. There was no thinking or analysis during this stage. Between age 5 and 10, it was rote memory. No thinking or analysis of the scriptures, simply repeating it. And so the whole Torah would be memorized. Well, at the same time, age 5 to 10, I wish Sean was here because he's, how old is he now? 11. He's going to be in the next bunch. So he, he already knows the Torah. So he, he would have been learning during this time. Jesus would have been learning as well the, the trade of his father, being a carpenter. And if the father obviously was in something else, a tent maker, he would make tents. But we realize from Mark 6, 3, that indeed Jesus learned to be a carpenter. When the people were trying to figure out and identify who Jesus was, they said, he's the carpenter. That's the one we're talking about. And so clearly he learned Jesus' or his father's trade. Age 10 to 14, they enter another phase of their education. It's called the Beit Talmud. And that was where they memorized the rest of what's called the Tanakh. The Tanakh was the rest of the Old Testament from Joshua to Malachi. So the next five years of their life, age 10 to 14, they memorized the rest of the Old Testament. Can you imagine so by the end of age 14, they have the whole Old Testament memorized. At least the good students do. The other ones are very familiar with it, at least. The Bet Talmud means the house of learning. And so uh, these were a very important time for the Jewish boy. Uh, they also learned during this time, this is very key, besides learning the Tanakh, the rest of the Old Testament, this is when they learn the art of rhetorical debating of questions and answers. So this is age 10 to 14. What are we teaching our kids now? <laughs> but okay, 10 to 14, they're memorizing the Tanakh and they're doing rhetorical debating of questions and answers. Very different than Western education. Western education teaches you concentrate on retaining knowledge of learning the facts and spitting it back out. But this is the art of critical thinking. And they were taught this at this young age. So instead of giving a rote answer back, when you're asked a question, you know, we are learned you give the right answer. In the Jewish culture, in Judaism, in the Eastern way of teaching, the young Hebrew boy had to give thought to the question and then answer the question with another question. This shows that they are able to process that information, process the answer, and be able to formulate a question back to the teacher. It's a lot more critical thinking. So this, this helped uh, the child to understand at a deeper level the scriptures and allow the teacher to understand that they really aren't just remote, by, you know, rote learning, spitting something back, but they're truly obtaining it. Which explains, when we get to Luke 2, 46 through 47, it says the people were amazed at Jesus' answers. But you don't have any place in Luke where it says that the teachers were questioning Jesus. It says that only he had questions. He was listening and he had questions. So their answers, though, why they said they were amazed at his answers, his answers were in the form of questions. So it makes sense. Elsewhere in the New Testament, you'll also see where someone asks a question, often of Jesus, and he'll reply with more questions. We see that repeatedly in the scripture. And then you'll say afterwards, the people were amazed at his answers. 
And I'd always be stopped by that and saying, well, he didn't give an answer. He just asked another question. Well, the questions were the answers. So it makes better sense in light of that. By the completion of this study period, by the end of the Bet Talmud, the fate of the Jewish boy, the fate of the Jewish boy at the age 14 would be pretty well determined at this point because they would have seen if this student got it or not. Was he brilliant or was he not? Was he the best of the best or was he average? And what happened is if he was one that was above average, brilliant, the, the cream of the crop really knew his stuff, and if the parents could allow it, they had enough in their family to carry on the trade, then the child from age 14 on would go on in their education to pursue either becoming a rabbi or a scribe. This is the cream of the crop, the best of the best. He was going to go to college and then on to a master's level if he continued on that path. If he was of average intelligence or didn't really apply himself diligently to his studies, then he stopped his education and he joined his father in the trade in which he was taught. The reality is that most of the boys ended their education at this point. They didn't go on. They didn't have that brilliant, that above average, that grasping of the scriptures that it took to be a rabbi or a scribe. And this is where we come to. So Jesus is age 12 when we hit Luke 2.41. So Jesus, at age 12, when we find him in the temple talking with the scribes and Pharisees, the teachers of the time, this is Jesus with his tremendous educational background. The whole Old Testament, the, the, the Torah memorized and halfway through the Tanakh being memorized. He's on the brink of being an adult. In that culture, age 13, you were an adult. You hear the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah. Well, they didn't have that tradition back then. That came centuries later. But it was still recognized at age 13, you are considered an adult. He was on the brink of adulthood, of being considered, of having the responsibility. When you're an adult, when you turn 13, you are now responsible for following the law, the religious law. Not that you weren't supposed to follow it before, but you weren't held accountable for it as a child. But now, at age 13, you are. So where do we, we enter then? Luke 2, 41. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Very devout. Uh, when he was 12 years old, now here's something. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. They were not required Within 15 miles, within 15 miles, if you live 15 miles from Jerusalem, if you're a male, you're required to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. If you live beyond that, you're not required. And if you've just attended one time in your life, you're, you're, you've, you've checked off your box. It's good. We've, you've had the experience. You don't need to keep repeating it. But they lived 63 miles from Jerusalem, and they went every year. That says something about their devotion to their faith, to their God. So every year, and obviously Jesus would have been a part of that, going every year. So when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Have you ever been left behind by your family? Who has ever been left behind by their family? You go ahead and, go ahead and admit it. We don't, I, I, my hand is raised. Evita, yeah, you left your daughter? No. <laughs> we never know if it's intentional or not, do we? They always tell us, no, they just forgot, but you know. All right, so they traveled on, then they traveled for a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. 
Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, when I read this passage, that's so familiar. We know this story. We know that little incident. But I had so many questions. So how did his parents not know that he wasn't, that he wasn't there? How is that possible? Why didn't Jesus tell them he was staying at the temple? Why didn't Jesus ask permission? Well, pretty quick in your research, you realize that they traveled in caravans. I'm sure you've heard this before. They traveled in caravans. Oftentimes, the women were out in front. The men were in the back. The mom thought he was with the dad. The dad thought he was with the mom. A lot of relatives, a lot of friends. It's easy to get all discombobulated. So, okay, that makes sense. But then Jesus, he doesn't ask permission or at least thoughtfully tell them he's staying back. Maybe he felt, you know, he was on the brink of adulthood being 12 years old. You know, I'm an independent soul. Maybe he had talked about it with them. And as older people get, their brains don't work so well sometimes with memory. Maybe the parents forgot. But then when they ask him, what's up? When they ask him, why why did you, why, why, what did they, what did they say? Why have you treated us like this? His reply to them sounds almost clueless, doesn't it? Why were you searching for me? Why, why were you, why? Didn't you know I'd be here? Maybe it was an intentional question to get them to think about the transition of his role that was about to take place. But either way, as I'm reading this, it seems that there is a lack of communication skills from Jesus, does it not? Or at least relational sensitivity. Now, you know we love Jesus tremendously, but we have to look at the scriptures here and try to understand it. Why isn't he showing compassion, caring, awareness of where they are? Why doesn't he do that first before making his point? And so my mind starts reeling. I'm thinking, this is God. This is, this is Jesus. We understand him as God-man. How does he not get it? Could it be just he's part of being 12 years old? Could it be that he really was human and even this way? And then, of course, it made me think that if God in Jesus, God missed this one, then surely we're going to miss it as well in our own communication as human, fully human beings. If we, if God missed thoughtfully requesting or making the, the connection points before he made his point, then we're probably going to make the same mistakes as being fully human. And maybe we should show a little bit more grace, not only to ourselves, but to those who lack that same getting it in our relationship communication parent-child, friend-to-friend, spouse-to-spouse. But we have this view that Jesus was this perfect child, this perfect human, which I have no doubt that maybe he was. He was perfect in that he desired to keep in relationship with God. He was perfect in that he took initiative to stay in connection with God, but he was also fully human. And I think this story profoundly shows this. As a fully human child, full human being, there were no doubt points that Jesus had to learn, had to not get it and then get it, not know and then come to knowing. In verse 52, it says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Do we see Jesus in this light? Do we allow him to stumble and not get it? to not know how best to communicate, to not being perfect and yet still being God who is perfect. How do we hold those two together? I don't have all the answers, obviously, but I'm thinking maybe our idea of God needs to be updated or explored a little more, or maybe our definition of what perfect, of what a perfect God looks like as well as being fully human. It gets better or worse, depending on your perspective. Verse 48, Mary asks the question, a question I think every mom asks at some point, why have you treated me like this? Why have you treated us like this? Moms, you've been there. 
no matter what age your child is, why are you doing this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Just a little side note, if you have a child or a teenager and you're thinking you have it rough, you're not alone. Even Mary, the mother of God himself, had preteen issues, right? So there's no hope for us if, if she faced that. Those of you who haven't had children yet, who are about to, just remember, Mary had God, and she still had issues. Imagine three days, three days looking, maybe four days he's missing. Imagine the panic that they would have felt. They cannot find it. Now, where Jesus was staying for those three days, I have no idea who took him in. Were they asking where his parents were? Who knows? They remembered. I'm wondering, how could this time period, as they're searching for Jesus, why wouldn't they have remembered Gabriel telling them that he is the son of God? Why wouldn't they have, have remembered Gabriel's message about what he would be doing Maybe all that goes out the window when faced with the frustrations of worry and concern in life. Or maybe they did recall what Gabriel said, but then stacked up against what they were seeing, a fumbling, growing, immature, not pristine, godlike child who looked and acted like everyone else, save for maybe where it really counted, but still in the regular ways of life, they're seeing this normal child and wouldn't that make you question Gabriel's message to you? Did, did I hear that right? Was this child who's acting very much like every other child, this is God? This is going to be our Messiah? It says that he learned and he grew in wisdom. So the mother is going to see those places of not learning and not growing until he does. And I would think that would cause question. Did they hear Gabriel right, or did, they, did he really mean what he said? It says in verse 50, they couldn't get their heads around it. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. So I'm looking at that. I'm like, but Gabriel, imagine having an angel appear before you, and all the experience that Mary and Joseph had leading up, how would they forget that? And it's encouraging, just like the children of Israel are encouraging when they mess up. This is encouraging to me. When we fail to remember God's goodness, when our faith falters, when we completely forget those God moments, and those times where a spirit comes close and those messages and those nudges from God, we're in good company. Because even those who have had angel visits, even those who had miracle after miracle done on their behalf, if even they forget or don't get it when the stress of life descends, then maybe we shouldn't beat ourselves up so much. And when we forget, when we fail to remember, we pick ourselves up instead and keep walking, knowing that this too is what it means to be human. We're not going to be perfect in our remembering and our thanking God. But if we can look at this story and say, Mary, Joseph, remember what God did for you, we can do that for our own lives. Remember, Denise, what God did for you. Remember, Hernando. Remember, Mark. What did God do for you? Don't forget. And God chose them as parents. God chose Mary and Joseph as his parents with all their doubting, sometimes forgetting, sometimes faltering. And he loved them and all of us so deeply despite the reality of being fully human. Before we go on for the rest of that passage, I want to go back to what Jesus was doing. Whenever I've read this passage about Jesus as a 12-year-old sitting with the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers and all of that, in the past, how I was taught through the years growing up with this passage was that as he lingered back there with them, he questioned them, he taught them, he basically took over the show. That's a picture that I have of Jesus as a 12-year-old coming into the scene, taking over the show, this precocious kid who puts them in their place, and he leaves them standing there realizing, compared to him, even as a 12-year-old, they didn't have a brain amongst them to match what this kid was doing. That's how I pictured what Jesus did. 
But then looking at the times, looking at how Jesus was educated, looking at what went on during the Passover, a different picture emerges. At the time of Passover, it was a common practice for the teachers, for Pharisees, for Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, one commentary says is the actual Sanhedrin, the, the elite of them, that would gather together in the public courts of the temple for the purpose of discussing religion and theology. And they would invite the public. The public were welcome at this time of Passover to sit with them, to listen, to ask questions, to dialogue and discuss. That was a common practice during that time. And so students would do this as well. And this is the scene that Jesus likely would have been a part of, something that was welcomed and encouraged, not that he just went in there to show them who's what and you know, put them in their place. And the phrase hearing and asking questions, listening and asking questions that we see that Jesus does here, that is a common Jewish phrase to indicate a student who is learning from his students, from his teachers. That's a common phrase of a student who is learning from his teachers. It's not about Jesus coming in and usurping the situation, but rather a picture of an eager student learning from those he considers to have more knowledge, his teachers that he wants to grow and learn from. It's a very different picture of Jesus than I had grown up with. Jesus then would have been in the thickest, deepest part of his studies yet. He's learning the rest of the Old Testament. He's learning the rhetorical debating. He would have been learning the art of this debating, questions with question, and he would want to put this into practice and eager to learn more. And I just have to pause. I'm picturing Jesus in his years growing up, his years especially between 10 and 14. What questions would young God ask about God? Through the study of the Torah and the Tanukh, is this how he learned about God being his father? At what point along his learning, along his education, from home to schooling, at what point did he realize his calling? Had his mom and dad told him? Or did he have a God experience that called and confirmed whatever he was asking and learning during this time period? What is clear is that Jesus was considered one of the best of the best students. Those, the reactions of everyone who heard him said they were amazed, the teachers, the rulers, the crowd. And it was therefore he was absolutely destined for the rabbi track. And we're going to talk about that, his continued education and his steps into ministry next week. But what I walked away from, this little couple, what, 11 verses here, and digging into the history, there's a couple things that I walked away from at the end of this that made me smile and think this is pretty cool. And that's what Jesus seems most intent upon, even at age 12. Here he is, this gifted child, AP student, honor student, astounding all around him. Yes, he's being a kid. He's excited, so excited about a topic of interest that he fails to communicate with his parents about his whereabouts. Typical child. But one thing is clear at this point. At this early age, he has a grasp of who he is and of who God is in relationship to him. That one line... I had to be in my father's house, I think says it all. His mom had just said, your father and I have been looking for you. And Jesus takes this, and it makes it clear then to his parents that he is stepping into a new path. Adulthood is being grasped now. His mission and his ministry calling is sinking in deep, 12 years old, sinking in deep and taking root And the one thing he knows for sure, the one thing at age 12 he knows for sure with all this happening is that this God he's learning about, this God who he's spending countless hours memorizing information about, this God who's been at the head of his family's faith, this God that he is trying to follow the best he can, this God is father to him. Loving, protecting, guiding, real heart-to-heart with him, Father. 
with all that he has learned by rote memory, by strategic debate, by hard work to the letter of the laws and traditions, he has come to know God as Father, which tells me all Jesus had was the Old Testament. All Jesus had was the Old Testament. How many times when we are reading the Old Testament do we get so frustrated by the pictures of God? There's killing left and right, and there's all sorts of passages we do not understand. And yet Jesus, at age 12, walks away with the perspective that God is his Father from the Old Testament alone. That's pretty profound. He weighed through all the law, the legalistic traditions, the customs, the history, the good, the bad, the ugly, and calls God his father. And that gives me hope. When we get bogged down, when we get frustrated, when we don't understand the Old Testament and what it's saying to us about God, we've got to keep pressing for the God that Jesus saw. At age 12, this is the other thing that I walked away from. At age 12, not being perfectly formed, not being fully mature, not clearly an adult, yet Jesus knew who God was and had a relationship of significance with him. He knew when God was telling him to do something, remain at the temple with me. He heard when God was calling him. Even at his young age, he could discern this and had the capacity to respond. He wasn't fully mature in other areas of his life, and yet he got this. God communicated with him and he with God at age 12. If a 12-year-old can get this, what beautiful and great hope is there for you and I? God wants to be our father and to have us hear him, to not only speak to him, but hear him speak to us, spirit with spirit, heart, mind, soul, and he will and he can. Seek me with all your heart, it says, and you will find me. And I think as we're on Mother's Day, this is for mothers and fathers, if we understand that 12-year-olds can do this, can have that relationship and that understanding, how are we helping our children Young children, older children, how are we helping our children find that relationship with God? How are we encouraging this? What are we doing within our families, within our relationship to create opportunities, to take time to talk about God, to live the relationship we have with them, to share it in our words and our actions with our children, no matter how old or young they are? It says Mary treasured all these things in her heart. My question is, what things? She walked away not understanding what was going on. And so I thought, wow, despite all that she didn't understand about what's going on, and how many times as we as a mom or a dad, we do not get what's going on. Like, we're, we want to, but we just can't get it. She didn't understand. She didn't know what to do as a mom with a son like Jesus and yet she treasured even the inconsistencies and the unknowns. She treasured them in her heart, I believe, because she knew that God was at work beyond what she could do, beyond what she could grasp. And when God is at the helm, you can treasure even those things you don't understand and you don't have the capacity for. Because God is bigger and he is our father of fathers, our mother of mothers. And that, despite all frustrations, that can give us hope. I'm going to do a little plug here. We do not have any active children's ministries going on at Inspire right now. We have several little ones amongst us, but we do not have any leadership or any program. If this is something that you would like to explore of how we can be as Inspire is, a place to inspire our we little ones, we're going to be starting from scratch and saying, okay, what does that need to look like for the schedules that we have in our families that we have, the lives that we lead? How can we help nurture? It may not look like it's looked in the past. It probably won't. And that's good and that's okay. 
but how can we help nurture the children in our own family here at Inspire so that they can grasp and hear and know God when they come into this building? We're sharing our faith here when they worship with us, when they're here and they talk and see us. But is there anything specific? And if God puts a nudge on your heart for that, come see me. I would like to explore that with you. I hope you have a good Mother's Day this weekend and treasure Treasure, treasure the things of your children in your hearts, those things you do not understand and those things that you do, and know that God has it beyond what we can even imagine. Let's stand with prayer. God, thank you. Thank you for historians. Thank you for those who wrote the Mishnah Thank you for those who have passed on what life was like so we can get a little grasp of what it may have been like for you as a child growing up and the tremendous background that you had leading into your calling and your ministry. I love picturing you as a kid. I can't wait to hear the stories. We can't wait, God, to we're in heaven with you and we're sitting around and we're eating food and we're laughing and talking and you get to tell us stories that are missing from our scriptures. We look forward to that. But God, we take encouragement. As we see the humanity, as we see of Mary and Joseph, as, as we see even of you growing in your years, even you as God growing and learning and becoming, that is encouraging to us in our journey and our walk. So help us to look to you, God, to know that wherever we are right now, and as far as we feel like we still need to go to be the person, the mom, the dad, the spouse, the friend, to, that we have a long way to go to where that person, let us know, God, that you're with us, that you, in the Old Testament, you say that you are our potter, you are our father, and then the very next line says you're, we're clay in a potter's hands. And so as that father, as that mother who shapes us, help us to just hold on to you and be shaped in just the way you would have us so we can continue to reflect your love to our family, to our children, to each other, to our community. We thank you, God. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.